What's up, guys? So today we have Jeffrey Verity Schofield back on the podcast. We are on literally opposite sides of the planet, so the connection was not perfect today. I had to splice some things together, but I tried to make it as good quality as possible as far as the audio volume. So hope you guys still enjoy. We have a lot of great topics today. Basically, it's like a continued part two of the last podcast. So if you enjoyed that one, I'm sure you will enjoy this one. Make sure if you do, subscribe, like, and leave comments down below. All right, man. So today we have Jeffrey Verity Schofield back on the podcast. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing great. How you doing? Good. I'm glad we were able to coordinate this. So we are literally as far apart time-wise as we could possibly be, right? 12 hours. Yeah, so yeah, 12 hours. Uh, it's, it's going to be less than ideal for either of us, but I think this is a decent time for both of us. So pretty reasonable. So uh, last time we talked a lot about, I mean, you know, we really got into like some of the stuff that blew up, right? Uh, the stuff with like Mike Gizertel and you with um, Greg Doucette and all that, that stuff. And uh, I'm sure we're still going to touch somewhat about the industry today, but I also wanted to dive into, you know, you kind of blew up on Quora, right? And that was like a lot of the advice that you were giving. Um, obviously, yeah. look, I mean, you've been training for, I think now seven years, right? Pretty seriously. Oh my God. Um, so we're going to get into some of like what you actually do. So I would say, you know, when you look at like people who are truly natural, um, you know, you look really good. I mean, I think you said you're about like 190, 195. Um, yeah, I'm back up to 200. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm back up to, um, just around 200 pounds, 90, 91 kilos. Um, and I do feel better at this weight compared to like 185. And if I get down to like 180, then I'll, I'll start feeling like not great. At yeah. All. Um, and it's actually a very fine line between feeling fine. So at like 84, 85 kilos, I'll feel fine. But if I go below that, then no. Yeah. Like it's like a one kilo difference. So if I go down like two pounds, my body's like, nope, we're not having that. And like, so if I wanted to get shredded and like, you know, competition shape, it's so much harder just losing those extra few pounds because it, it's a way more than you actually think it is. Right. So how lean would you say you are at 200 pounds? Mm, low teens. So um, like I still have some quad feathering, like veins and lower abs, bit of serratus, Christmas tree, you know, some biceps vascularity. I would say like probably low teens. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's pretty impressive dude, at 200 pounds. I mean, would you say that you, because I know we talked before about like in China, you're just like a monster, but even, you know, if you were like in America, I mean, do you feel like you, you had a pretty good response? Because it seems like that, relatively speaking. A response to like the training you mean or? Correct. Yeah. Like, you know, bigger than the average person and, you know, responded pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would say I, I have better than average genetics and I train harder than the average person and, and smarter than the average person as well but that, that's not like saying that's right saying, right <laughs> the average is uh you know like the minute you compare yourself to the average you win right as long as you're, you're not completely shit because the average yeah. is already shit right um like the average dude is pushing 30 percent body fat right it's like a, a 40 inch waist um so it's just you know, maybe that's not the right metric to sure. actually compare to. Um, but plus, I think, you know, being in China has definitely shifted my perspective. Like I've been here a decade and then I've only trained for seven years. Right. So I've never really like trained in American gyms or, mm. or European gyms. Um, so, you know, who knows? Maybe my perspective would be different. Maybe my performance would be different as well if you have like just an environment where the standards are actually higher. Right. Now you push yourself pretty hard. Um, you obviously follow like a lot of the evidence-based training. Would you say, cause a lot of times what happens is people will train, like let's say they're training for 15 years, but they'll say, well, the first like five years was BS or I was training with the football team in high school or whatever crap they were doing. Um, it sounds like maybe you were training pretty well the majority of the time. Is that accurate? Yeah, well, I think it's a pretty good rule of thumb that most people fuck up the first year or two. Mm -hmm. 
but like it's also it also doesn't matter yeah very much right because you're so sensitive to training as long as you like especially if you have above average genetics as long as you put in decent effort and like you you're working on the main movements and you just you know not training like a pansy basically you're going to see the majority of your growth in the first few years anyway right even if it's kind of mediocre um you know that being said like once you're intermediate then you sort of have to analyze because hey suddenly not everything works and you're going to have to actually like sort through what works and then also what works for you and part of that is is you know the evidence and the science-based stuff but a lot of that is more sort of intuitive more of the art side of things rather than the science um and that's where i think you know science is a very very good starting point it's a whole lot better than the alternative of just like bro science and pseudoscience and just you know this works because this the big guy said so that kind mm-hmm. of thing but at the same time you sort of have to distill and then find what works for you and that might actually be the opposite of what science says you know if science says volume 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 but if you find that personally you see better progress on lower volume well then the n equals one of yourself is maybe you know the way to go rather than you know just sort of going the way of the science just because you know oh there's so much evidence there but you know right sometimes going on your own intuition is actually just straight up better yeah well i was just on another person's podcast yesterday and that's like one of the things i was talking about is like well you know we talk about how volume is the primary driver of hypertrophy is kind of something that's said a lot but it's like there's some controversy about that right and it's like yeah but the volume's not going to do anything if you don't have sufficient intensity and like there's a lot of factors that go into that i think it's hard to really pinpoint like this one factor um but also i was saying how i i understand that the science kind of tends towards this direction but anecdotally and again there's a bias right like who comes to me like if somebody i was going to say like i've had so many clients who've come to me from like a certain higher volume camp right where they feel like they got to constantly ramp up volume and within like two months like the, the progress we've made is dramatic compared to what they have done but i'll admit there's a bias there because if they were getting great results before they, they probably wouldn't have come to me right so there is that bias but i just see it time and time again like okay people and, and like jeff alberts from 3dmj i gave as an example because it's like he was doing three sets of 10 when he was 17 and he's still doing three sets of 10 yeah. now there's been a volume progression, right? Cause he's stronger. So the volume load of sets times reps times weight is higher, but this, I, I just really don't buy into this idea that you need to just be doing dramatically more volume all the time. You know, when you're 40, you're going to be doing 80 sets, right? Yeah, no, it's like, it's, it's kind of, I think Brett Contreras did a, a, a good post. It was a while ago, maybe a year or something. And it was something like, just, you know, think about how much work, 40 sets per week per muscle group is just, you know, if you're taking, and then the evidence also says, you know, take three minutes of rest versus one minutes of rest. Because right. Three minutes is going to be better because you have better recovery and better quality of sets. Okay. So you're taking three minutes per set mm-hmm. in rest because that's what the evidence says. And of course you got to go by the evidence. Um, in that case, actually, I, I agree, but then, you know, you have your 40 sets and that's on the low side. That's not even 45 sets. You're slapping right. <laughs> per week. Um, So that's, you know, that's two hours per week, roughly, you know, 40 sets, three minutes. That's not even counting warmups because, you know, if you're doing working sets on basically any, anything, you need some kind of warmup and more for, for some movements. Right. And that's per body part. Yeah. And and warmup sets, you know, they do count for something. They're not Mm -hmm. super stressful, but they do add up and it is tonnage. And so, you know, the body has roughly what, 12 to 14 major muscle groups that you're going to be ideally targeting, like calves, hamstrings, quads. Not many people do targeted adductor work. Those are sort of mixed in with lower body stuff. Glutes often are targeted, but, you know, sometimes those are overlapped as well. Erectors are also often just sort of thrown in with lower body squats and deadlifts. But then you also have, you know, lats, traps, uh, you know, horizontal or vertical pulls, typically. Uh, then you have chest, shoulders, biceps, triceps, and sometimes forearms get some some love, some love as well. Plus, you have the neck. Some some people. So that's yeah. twelve, let's say, body parts. Um, and you could you know you could make the case for adductors. You could make the case for like 
anterior tibialis and other small right things. right but like let's just say let's just say 10 like let's let's yeah. throw some stuff together you know forearms don't need a ton of stuff if you're training biceps so it's 400 sets per week yeah 400 sets per week you know and that's that's you know where do you all where do you fit it all in you know what i mean like who has time for that and who can actually recover from that because if yeah. they're actually on a sets if they're actually you know because the evidence again is like you better be somewhat close to failure right and and like let me just like train rack, you know you know, to play devil's advocate a little bit, like one, of course, there's going to be a lot of crossover. And I think even in those studies, yeah. they did say like a set of pressing counted for triceps. So like, there's a lot of crossover there. Yeah, yeah. It would um, be 400, it would be 250 or something. Yeah, yeah. And you could say, well, I, I superset my antagonistic muscle groups and all that stuff, but it's still, right. it's still a lot. And, and the thing is, if you told me, like, if I actually believed that it would work, maybe maybe not now but like my high school and college self would have done it but i just i just genuinely don't see it i mean i've, I've had so many experiments so i've done a lot of unilateral experiments where it's like okay i'll do literally just this on this leg so i've been doing just right-sided calf raises for a year and a half now zero difference at all and i'm just going to keep doing it you know and i'm just going to keep the doing biggest it. flex ever <laughs> yeah um zero difference whatsoever it's funny. I just, we had a family picture with my brother and like my whole family for Father's Day were riding bikes. And like, there's my brother who like hasn't worked out in like years and his calves are like twice the size of mine. And I've trained mine for like 17 years. Um, I've been doing just left leg press. Like, so I add that volume. And then uh, I'm actually working on some uh, pull up and push up goals with just my left hand or my left arm. So we'll, I haven't done any measurements on that one. So we'll see. But in short, like if I, my theory is like, if you're already getting sufficient volume, then all, all this like additive stuff, maybe for like a specialization phase or something. But other than that, I'm, I'm just not well, that into it. You'll get a pump. That's the mm -hmm. thing. Like, you know, that's, that's one thing where, well, we can go back into Mike Gizardell. He's been having like a series of videos where it's like how to use the pump to mm -hmm. decide your training volume. <laughs> Oh, it does be really well. Big cultish, I'm getting a big cultish vibe from RP um, recently. Because yeah. that video, and this is going to sound like hate, it's really not, because I actually like their stuff, generally speaking. It had no dislikes wow. for a while. Yeah, a video on how to use the pump to signal your volume decisions had no dislikes. Hmm. And that's not really evidence based at all like at all no yeah. evidence-based coaches actually like you know can you imagine if i asked a client and i'm like yeah so did you get a good pump like how was the pump like rate your pump yeah um from 10 to, to 1 like no it's just it's it's kind of ridiculous actually um but yeah no it's it's the volume thing it just doesn't pan out can you imagine if i wrote a client like a 250 set per week training plan <laughs> like, that's not really a metric to use when it comes to how to adjust your, adjust your training volume it's not really a metric to use for anything for a natural mm -hmm. i think for an enhanced lifter maybe there's some value in it just anecdotally it seems like the pump sort of became a thing with larry scott the first mr olympia he would sort mm -hmm. of chase the pump using super short rest times like 15 seconds and just do tons and tons and tons of volume literally sometimes 40 or 50 sets in a workout for shoulders, but they were all sort of like, it was almost like the whole workout was one set. Yeah. Right. Right. It's like an extended you're, set. you're chasing the pump. You're always, you're just trying to maximize the blood flow into the muscle. Arnold obviously was a big fan of the pump. He, you know, spoke endlessly about his right. adoration <laughs> for the, the lights of the pump. He was releasing everywhere with the pump. And, you know, since then, like that's just sort of, but the silver era before before the Mr. Olympia was even a thing, like into the 1950s, the 1940s, the 1930s, um, before steroids were really a thing, they didn't really do pump style of training. It was a lot of sort of moderate reps, low reps even. A lot of them did like Olympic weightlifting as well. A lot of them were sort of like jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. But you don't really they didn't train with like 15 to 20 reps and drop sets and stuff like that. 
where they're you know that typical pump style of training and you know and this is what enhanced bodybuilding sort of is whereas if you train this way as a natural i'm not going to say there is no benefit because maybe there is a little bit for like one set at the end just to get a pump like you walk out of the gym with a pump and it's nice because it's like right. seeing yourself in the future right it's like who doesn't love a good pump? i love a good pump like i'm not hating on the pump yeah, yeah. i'm just saying it's not really a tool to use to inform you how you should train and if you focus too much on that you know welcome to stagnation city basically right because you can't do everything you know yeah, I would just want to, it's tough because like, this is now, I don't know, like the third or fourth podcast where I've talked about like the failure thing with Mike, or now it's, you know, the, this pump thing. And it's, I'd like to get him back on the podcast to discuss it with him because, you know, like, I don't want to be like a hater on him and everything. And like I said, we've met before and he's a very nice guy and all that. I just, you said like, it's almost getting cultish with RP. And I, I do wonder what's going on because there is kind of like what everybody considers like the evidence-based crew like some of like the names that we all know and then i've heard a number of people even within that like some like well-known coaches or like former rp employees and stuff like that who would who were basically saying what you're saying and that like you know they're just like pulling a lot of this stuff out of their ass and, and it's not evidence-based i mean it's yeah just, <laughs> at this point like i i i love the guy i love his sense of humor um you know, I'm a big fan of his channel. I think he's more logic based. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a better way to put it, you know, because what he says does make a lot of sense in some cases for certain populations. But is he really science based? I'm not sure because a lot of what he says doesn't really, you know, stack up like disruption. You know, how how sore were you after the workout? Is that really an indicator? Right. Of, I mean, his three indicators were pump disruption slash soreness and performance mm. and that last one i'm all about right if you're getting stronger ignore those other two those don't matter at all like yeah that's you know it's more like you know that last one is probably 80 or 90 percent of what matters again yeah. for a natural um and well, you know, it's anything, so easy to induce soreness and it's so easy oh, to like, induce a pump which yeah exactly you know any trainer can induce both of those like super easily you know that's yeah and i know some trainers who that's because people think it's a great workout if they got both of those because they can right. feel those yeah um and so they know like oh i'm just gonna have them do drop sets on bulgarian split squats mm -hmm. have fun with your sore glutes like yeah <laughs> i fucked i'm such a good trainer right um and like that might work for some people but it's not something that is going to be a great general recommendation um it's like you see these coaches who have the genetic elite and then they use those genetic elite as advertising as marketing sure. and they just parade them around well it's like uh, a, a thing of cauliflower could have trained that athlete like, <laughs> literally yeah. anything you know a dandelion could have anything and so you know plus when with with the the super responders to steroids when you if you if you tick all the right boxes in terms of like genetics the genetic response the hard work, like all these other things, your program can suck. It can literally just, oh yeah, be, you just pick a bunch of the, just the shittiest exercises and like, you're good to go, man. You do a lot, you recover and grow really well. You don't do that much. Well, you grow anyway. So it, yeah. it's like, it's almost secondary. You know, just it's don't funny. fuck yourself up and you'll be fine. Don't snap your peck and you'll get fucking right. right. That's <laughs> I, uh... pretty much what it is on that podcast that I was on yesterday, it's, they asked me about that. And I said, look, like the only reason I will ever like really focus on that is if you, sometimes you just have clients. I mean, this is actually pretty common in like commercial gyms and they'll be like, Oh, well, I just got this really good workout. You know, I have like, my parents were like that with the trainer, like, well, they, they had me do this circuit and like, I was doing this exercise. I felt really good. And like, that's how, but that's really how the average person gauges their progress. Yeah. It's how did that workout feel? I mean, that's, that's almost entirely how they base it. Like the average person, not in like the fitness industry following this kind of stuff, they think of like that workout and it's a, it's a huge issue. Um, but we talked about that the a lot. Next so. kind of, yeah. The athlete next kind of thing. It's like this workout, like how did it feel? Do something new, something novel, you know, do lateral raises with plates because it gets clicks, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Right. Um, 
but it's not like it's it's more effective you know what i mean and and it's the thing is they know it's less effective mm-hmm. that's a, that's the thing they know it's less effective i think somebody like athlete and x does it i think a lot of like commercial gym trainers have no idea i think like like your weekend course trainer i think they genuinely have no idea a lot of the times they just yeah that's the thing that's why like yeah i've made a few videos about mike and about renaissance periodization but like i have so many more that i could have made already Mm -hmm. like maybe not half the time but perhaps a third to a quarter of the time i'll watch one of his videos and be like oh i want to make a video (laughs) like this this using the pump to inform your progress on volume decisions. Like, oh my God, I want to make a video. But they're generally a force for good. Yeah. Like they're better than 90% of content out there. Like it's it's a shit show out there. Right. And so, you know, it's like, do I tear down someone who is generally one of the good guys, but who kind of has some blind spots? Right. Because I think part of the side effects of steroids is you forget how you train when you were natural. Totally. Like you just, okay, well, I was doing basic stuff and now I'm chasing the pump and I guess everyone should chase the pump. Yeah, well, that, that was a big topic of conversation I had, even with some clearly like and like openly enhanced guys. I said, look, it's not to say that I think you can't learn from enhanced guys. I absolutely think you can. But sure. I mean, I talked about this with uh, John Meadows, Pete Rubish, like a couple of these people. And I said, I just think it just becomes clouded because you're still making progress so you associate it's like impossible to take away that bias and you you just genuinely forget slash are unaware of the fact that if you were not enhanced it just wouldn't work um and one of the examples or counter examples i gave is like i know people some people will say well no that's not true because my dose has been the same or i've even lowered my dose and i'm still growing and my that's- counter to that is like okay so that's a stimulus right but imagine you were taking a two, you were in a 2000 calorie surplus, right? And you dropped that to a thousand calorie surplus. Guess what? You, you're still not maxed out on that surplus. And so you're still going to keep going. And over time, you will be bigger on that thousand calorie surplus than the 2000. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's crazy because, and then you have people who, and most of those guys, those guys trained naturally for a while in a lot right. of the cases. And now you have guys who, their first year in the gym, mm-hmm. they started taking something. You know, I, I've heard people who went to coaches and they were offered like, here's my training package. Here's my diet package. Here's my SARMs and steroid package. Like without even asking, they were just like, and they knew they were in the first year of training and this is what the coaches sent. Like, here are your options for yeah. cycle. Like, yeah. really? I mean, it's just, it's just so over the top. And you know, there are so many reasons not to take steroids in the first year of your training, especially yeah. when like, you're a teenager. Um, but people, some people think it's needed. Like some people are so red pilled right. that they genuinely believe, they just have this belief from TikTok or Instagram or, or YouTube or somewhere else, it's almost always social media, that natural muscle growth is just a complete fool's errand. And I've been told like, I'm an idiot for staying natural. Right. Like, why the why the fuck would you stay natural? I've, I've, I've had people straight up say that. Like, try to shame me for staying natural. Yeah. Like, oh, you could be making so many more gains, but you're staying natural. Like, that's that's completely r- ridiculous. <laughs> it's like the opposite. Like, you can't win. Um, yeah. with some of these people, it's just nuts. So, have you? It actually goes back to like the first thing we were talking about. Um, because one thing I was going to ask is how do you feel your progress? Cause I, some people have taken my stance to say that like you make most of your gains in the first few years to mean that like you don't progress at all. And it's like, that's not my actual opinion. It's like, look, like when I say I'm not yeah. progressing at all, that's because yeah. it's been 15 years of doing really actually almost 18 years of doing like everything, how I'm supposed to do it. But I'm definitely yeah. not like Abel, um, who you were on his podcast, you know, he's, he's definitely made progress in the last year too. And he's probably eight, years sure. in or something like that so i was going to say if you're seven years in how do you feel you compare to yourself six years in whenever i see myself at a given weight i look leaner and bigger at that at that weight so even in this past like year um since gyms reopened um you know i think i've gained two or three kilos maybe two kilos 
at the uh, same muscle. length. Oh, that, that's uh, huge. Yeah, that, that's the same. So like less fat, more muscle. Yeah. Um, but at the same body weight. Um, and I've, act I've actually taken, one thing I would advise beginners or intermediates or anyone who hasn't done this yet is to take measurements, to be like, you know, take, take your arm, take your upper thigh, take your calves, even if you don't give a shit about calves, just take them yeah. anyway. Like, it's just data. It's not hard to collect. It takes 10 seconds per body part. Um, take neck, take forearm, take waist, take chest, take shoulders. Um, you know, just the basics. That might seem excessive. I know it sounds yeah. excessive to like the average fitness person who doesn't, who's not a bodybuilder, you know, but it's good data. And that's one of the few ways to actually track muscle growth. Yep. Because if you don't track these actual things, like you have no idea past the first few years because it is slow. Um, well, I think you so saw my video on that maybe like a month ago or so on like tracking progress, like the ones that pictures can be deceiving. And I said, basically what you said, like the measurements, measurements, yeah. like given body weight, if, you, if you're at the same body weight, your waistline's a yeah. quarter inch down, your arms are a quarter yeah. inch up, you, you, you know, you're bigger. Yeah, and leaner, right? yeah for sure. Um, like I can check in July um, 2019. So basically two years ago, um, my calves were half an inch smaller than they are now. And my arms were an inch smaller. My forearms were half an inch smaller. Um, and my quads were two inches and an inch and a half smaller. So with right and left. And so, and then my, uh, my chest is four inches bigger. Wow. And my, uh, my shoulders are two inches bigger around. So give people an idea of like what, because sometimes I'll ask people their measurements because I think, you know, pictures and everything could be deceiving. So you're 200 pounds. Yeah. What are you yeah. looking at? So 200 pounds, um, 16 and a quarter for each calf. 16.75 um, for this arm and then 16. <laughs> yeah for this song so there's a there's pretty a big, big difference mine as well big difference there i i have some significant imbalances i think it's from two things once one when i was a runner when you're a runner you always run on tracks in the same way because that's where how you compete mm -hmm. and then cambered roads lead to hips being uneven because the camber is there for the water to run off the sides and you always run on the same side of the road so that you don't get hit by a car and so you run on the left side of the road so that you can see the traffic coming towards you, you know, just get blindsided. Right. And so because of that camber, you're running on a slight deficit on one side compared to the other, because you're running on like slight slope. Um, so that has caused some imbalances, you know, cause I was a runner for 10 years before I started lifting. Mm -hmm. And then also I have uh, a messed up right wrist from a motorcycle accident. Also before I started lifting, and so if I do mixed grip, I can do left under right over, but the other way is like not really feasible. Like I can okay. do it, but it's not, it's not, it's very painful. So I don't, I just oh, do wow. the one side. And so that has led to some imbalances in, in the hips and the upper back and, and it's visible, but like, it doesn't really impact training much. And there's also not that much I can do about it. I guess I could use straps, the deadlifts. Um, but apart from that, it's not really, it's not really something that I'm like too concerned about. Right. Um, and then forearms right now, 13 and a quarter, neck 16 and a half, right thigh 25, left thigh 24 and a half, uh, chest 44 and a half, which has improved a lot recently actually. Waist 30, wrist 7, ankle 9.5. And with wrist and ankle, you're not going to be like, that shouldn't be changing much. Sure. Maybe if you're retaining water a little bit. But you like, said your wrist is what? 7. So, okay. Oh, uh, well, it, it's either 7 or 6.75. Okay. Um, sort of it's funny because um, Abel and I have talked about how we are like so similar in terms of like weight and body fat and, and measurements and everything. But really, I mean, if you have somebody at, so like at 200 pounds, I have almost identical measurements to you other than smaller calves. Um, but what I would say though, is it doesn't look like that. And that's because you're definitely leaner. Like there's no question you have more muscle than me just looking at you and like hearing it. So I'm probably this, stronger though. 
maybe i don't You're know probably what stronger than me. what's your we'll get that later maybe yeah okay yeah yeah um <laughs> but and that is something i've noticed too i've always been stronger than i look um and also part of it is i feel like with muscle, man, it is just so genetically determined. Uh, obviously, you know, you've got to work hard and everything, but I'm just saying like, it, it's like almost like just like one factor where strength has a lot of factors to it, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. like, and so like there's a technique and, um, you know, moment arms and everything like that. So uh, when I look at that, I'm like, okay, at, at 200 pounds, I've, you know, close to, it's like 17 and like 16 and a quarter for the arms and stuff like that. And, and you know, there's a big discrepancy and thighs are probably similar. Uh, chest is again, like almost identical, uh, but definitely not as lean. And so people, I think it's good to focus on the measurements, obviously. And like, for, like we're talking about gauging progress here, but it's definitely not just about measurements. I mean, I've seen people with 15 inch arms who they blow yeah, my seventeen away, you know? So yeah, yeah. A lot of it's leanness and then insertions and then it depends on the angle sometimes. And if you're flexing the lighting, like there's so many factors. Um, like if I'm doing a biceps curl from the front, for whatever reason, I, and I've even been accused of Photoshopping really? pictures when I just took a screenshot, my, my triceps flare out to the side a lot mm -hmm. and, and my biceps insert very low. Um, so especially when I'm at a low body fat percentage, they look like 20 fucking inches. They really? look, I mean, it just, it looks, it looks, I don't do even post know, those pictures because they'll get just, just like, do just you know your arm span? Torn apart. Um, a little bit over my height. So okay. like maybe six foot, six feet, two inches or something. Okay. So that's something I, I talk about as well. Um, and I, Abel and I were, did it on camera where his were like, I don't know, maybe half inch smaller than mine, but I have a six, four arm span and oh, like, yeah man like it Hard to <laughs> they just in. look stringy like it just doesn't yeah. look like anything i mean don't get me wrong i can take a picture that looks good but i'm just yeah. saying like just like like a flex on camera like flex your your, your right arm is bigger right yeah and that is seven, you said 16.75 so yeah, they've, they've yeah you could see yeah <laughs> it's, a, it's a big arm like your arm is bigger than mine right 17 well now i'm a little bit lighter so probably at 16 and three quarters yeah so it's identical and it's yeah. like I do have like a very sweepy tricep plus yeah. combined with the forearm. Like it's, you know, it's just a lot of it is genetic and I try to be as honest as possible when it comes to like realizing that is a lot genetic. Mm -hmm. and someone is like, comes to me and they're like, Jeff, I want to look at, look like you. And I'm like, well, that's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I don't say that, but I'm just like, come on. Like, did you, ever watch, did you ever watch Jerry Ward on BioS3? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, it's one of those times where you revisit a channel mm -hmm. after like five years or six yeah, yeah. years of not, it's kind of like died down a little bit. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I've, I've watched his stuff before. He's largely like Generally political now good. too, but um, yeah. he, you know, like Jason Blaha would say, what was his tagline was like, he would end with like a bicep flex, right? and yeah. um yeah yeah every video yeah yeah and he has admittedly like horrible bicep genetics like he tore a bicep and just his his genetics for looking impressive like arm wise are really bad and he would be like 220 and it would just look not impressive and then i remember jerry like came off gear dieted down he was like 170 and he would still do his little like bicep shot and it still looked awesome. You know, he just like had really good genetics for that. And he was lean and yeah. um, just, yeah. there, there's so much more to it than just size, especially when you're talking about pictures. Yeah. Pictures like you can do some, and I post on my Instagram, like you change the angle like slightly and you mm -hmm. just reveal the vascularity or like the definition. And it's like, it's like, it looks like a completely different person. Yeah. And a lot of people were like, that's a before and after with pump and lighting. I'm like, nope, it's exactly the same lighting. It's just me literally turning my arm. Yeah, wow. 30 degrees. I, I saw the one picture. I think I referenced it even in my video, but yeah, yeah, that was a pretty. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's like some some people thought like I did, you know, a filter or some other bunch of shit. No, it's literally two screenshots just five seconds apart. Wow. And it just shows like, and some people, you know, it's hard to say if it's like manipulative or smart. Like this wasn't manipulative because I was like, showing them together mm -hmm. but some people like they they do only videos in like the perfect downlighting yeah when pumped you know when super lean 
and um, that's not the real that's not really the reality of being super lean, especially if you're natural, because you know the minute you put on a hoodie, right, people are like fear. bringing you rice because they think you're right. stuck to death. <laughs> like, you don't they don't think you're Jack. They just they, they you know they think you're skinny basically. Yeah. So it's interesting. And when I was actually, I don't know if you know Brian Borstein or Aaron Straker, but we did a podcast together and. It's funny, we were talking about you and we were just saying like a lot of us, I feel like a few of us have like this similar mold where like it's like you, me, Abel, Brian, Aaron, uh, maybe this guy, Brandon DeCruz, like we're all similar age, other than Brandon, you know, similar, yeah, similar uh, stats and everything, similar views. And we were just saying how they were talking about the influence of like when you're developing like when you're like growing up and like how that can affect like long-term progress and everything and i said i don't i don't know if it has a big influence i mean i started so young so it's like tragic to think that if i started later i'd be even worse but um (laughs) but i I do Uh, wonder in terms of the imbalances because so i'm right-handed and i've like always had half to three quarters of an inch in a bigger size on my right arm um and even like like my lats, like if you look at it, they're like not totally even, like it's just always been that way. And years ago, like probably eight years ago, I started switching to like everything left-handed. And I mean everything. So like, (laughs) I like brush my teeth with my left hand. Like I will consciously take in the groceries with my left hand. All these things didn't make any difference. Um, I was even like working on patients with my left hand for a little while there. And I've done specific uh, like volume phases What's that? I hope they survived. Most of them did. And uh, so right now I'm actually doing, so it's four sets per week of one arm push-ups and uh, four, four sets per week of like trying to get to a one arm pull up. So we'll see if I ever get there, but like doing like progressions to like, you know, help with that. Yeah. And I'll take measurements soon, but like I've done left arm specialization phases before and I, I was never able to catch up the difference. Like it just seems like there's just like, it's just maxed out and it's just going to be permanently maxed out half an inch lower. So I don't know if you've had any experience trying to, you know, fix that. Well, um, I haven't really put in single arm work. Um, cause that's like the go-to recommendation, right? Right. Correct your imbalance, do more work with, mm-hmm. with the weak side. That's, I'm not even sure if there's like evidence that it helps because you know, it's like the go-to recommendation, but I've never seen anything scientific to back it up certainly well volume is um, the primary uh, driver of hypertrophy right yeah you just do 45 sets per week and you're good to go right yeah um but and even anecdotes i haven't heard a lot of people who actually successfully brought up that big of a weak point because half an inch or, or three quarters of an inch on your arm i mean that's a lot yeah like it's, it's visible right like i for me it's visible like you could see yeah. people are like you, your right arm is bigger and like yeah yeah it is bigger like your right arm looks bigger <laughs> yeah, yeah it is it is actually yeah. <laughs> um and i haven't really heard many people who were like yeah yeah my 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 left arm was lagging a ton and then i did just do this you know right. what i mean like yeah. in parentheses after the video like just do this like mm-hmm. <laughs> just do one exercise and you'll cure right. all your balances. um I don't know if it's, it might be like an upper back thing. It might be nerve related. Um, just because you do see people who have, like if they get nerve damage, it affects their muscularity dramatically. Um, like I know Dan Green, the power lifter, he had like a nerve triceps firing issue. And like, that's when you'll actually see like one side degrade significantly. Like if you actually... It's, it's almost like it's more important than training it or not training it. The fact that there's a nerve there, because mm-hmm. if a body part is naturally big, even like basic day-to-day stuff might be enough to like, to have an imbalance. So if you're like, if you're just naturally getting way more neural drive to one side, which most people do, because like most people are either left-handed or right-handed, right? Very few people are actually genuinely ambidextrous. And can you, can you solve that neural drive issue? by adding in a bunch of sets and like trying to drive up that mind muscle connection, which is sort of like a really a mind nervous system muscle connection. I don't know. Like I haven't really seen much or any evidence for that really. Um, 
there's actually a surgery I saw today in China for women who want smaller calves. I saw that. So, yeah. Yeah. Like what? The f- so I guess they like go in there and they like snip away at some nerves and then like causes the muscle to atrophy because you're just always training your calves, right? right. You're walking shit. So I guess the only way is to like snip away part of the nerve, but who the fuck thought that was a good idea, right? Like yeah. the woman in the story is like, now I'm getting pain and the muscle is just as big. Yeah, like, right. So oh. I trouble walking and shit. Like I, uh, <laughs> I would never actually recommend this, but um, like I'll give people Botox injections, right? So like that's a toxin and, and it basically prevents it, the muscle from working. And right. I've joked about like, all right, so I'm going to like put Botox in my soleus and then see if that makes your gastric bigger due to the compensation. Because they actually do. I mean, that's been shown like, in mice. If they yeah. take out like one of the muscles, the other sure. muscle will compensate. And it's like, all right, I've tried everything else. Let's try that. <laughs> you probably like, well, like it's one of those things where in theory, like it might work. But also in theory, it could go like terribly wrong. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it, so it's, it's definitely. I would never recommend that nerve thing. The Botox is temporary, so like you'll have your right. function back within, and it's not like a complete knockout most of the time, depending on the dose. Yeah. Um, that's a shame that she's in that situation, and I mean, you really probably can't undo anything with that. You know, those nerves are not coming back. Yeah, I don't know. Like, there's it's 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 tough when you see people. Um, who have like just this really weird view of their own body. And I think this is what, what leads to anabolic steroids in a lot of cases. Like they're just like the skinny kid and like they want to do something about it. And they have this really strong drive to like to get big or to get smaller yeah. calves or to like get a smaller waist. And this is what causes people to do crazy, ridiculous stuff, which often in the long term kind of comes back to bite them in the ass. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, it's it's tough to see because even though they brought it on themselves, like when a when a you know a big bodybuilder passes away at at forty years old or thirty five years old, you know, it's it's tough to see. Yeah. You know, even if they brought it on themselves, like I still have like empathy for the situation and sympathy for the situation, but it's it's a little bit different than if it was like someone getting hit by a car or like some right. random. Definitely. like cancer or something like that like it's you know it, it's it would be heartless not to empathize at all but it's sort of like their decision at the same time yeah um and I it's think like in, especially in uh like female bodybuilding but like there's like a lot of psychological issues i mean i don't know too many well-balanced yeah. women who are regular competitors and that's not to say that they don't exist yeah. because i do you know gotta, some who do yeah but yeah, and, and especially the ones who are enhanced. Like you're a woman who is enhanced, who is getting like yep. sh- shockingly lean, we- like I hate to say weirdly muscular, but you know what? No, it's, it's weirdly are. muscular. Like yeah. that's the it's, correct way to put it. Like you see, they're just their faces are like masculinized and veiny, and like yeah. You know, for for men, you know, becoming hyper masculine and just hugely muscular, I think it's still not a great look. Mm-hmm. From most women's perspective and just most general population people in general um but yeah female bodybuilding it's a it's i mean it's weird like i'll just yeah, that's just my something, opinion. there's something going on there you know it's off. The like it's thing. just it's it's really it's not something i would uh ever personally recommend or like personally be attracted to it's just you know their body their choice at the end of the day i guess it's probably the best way to just to put it yeah but yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, care yeah. what somebody does. It's just, I, I just, I can't help but stand back and think like that person has a lot of like, whether it's insecurities or issues or something's going on there. And I don't even really consider bodybuilding. Like when I think of like the fitness industry, I don't really think of like enhanced bodybuilding. Like, of course, like if you like Instagram, like fitness, right, there's going to be a million like bodybuilders, but yeah. I, I don't really think of like the fitness industry as like, IFBB pro bodybuilders. I mean, it, it's really totally different goals. Um, yeah. It, it's just totally different goals. It's not about health at all. Like, that's the thing. Because um, the average person, let's say the average person is like, you know, overweight and they have a little bit of a belly and they want to get rid of it. Well, they think, oh, well, I see this and they want to build some muscle. Like, they just want to get in better shape. They want to better their health. Um, and they, 
they look at these sort of like huge jacked shredded guys and they're like well they're like way far on the other end of, of mm-hmm. what i want obviously they know what's going to help me yeah right right but like they're a five percent body fat and 300 pounds like yeah they're gonna i'm gonna want to buy their plan just look at him and i've had people straight up say to me like look at you why would i buy your plan like compared to blah 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 steroid user enhanced lifter and i'm we just like both, i think you you get from guys i think that's probably more common um yeah i think from women they are often like no i don't want to look like that well but even guys too i remember a guy like hating yeah. on who was he hating on like one of my dumbass friends in college and he was like giving all of his advice from like jeff's side and he was like yeah man he looks shredded and i was like dude like you're an idiot <laughs> like yeah. i just like how is that what you're basing this on like this guy is a moron like the stuff he's saying is ridiculous i don't know if you remember this there was a whole thing of like uh jeff sides had there was a video he doesn't eat carb or he doesn't eat eggs because of the carbs is what he said and oh god like, oh god yes this was years back actually um, it's, yeah uh, the carbs <laughs> all those carbs and eggs um, like yeah. and yeah that's that's the guy who's charging hundreds of dollars for his <laughs> system or whatever yeah, yeah yeah it's just ridiculous yeah and it works like that's the sad part well look it at works. um who's the guy i never really paid much attention to him but i saw a couple who make videos on it recently the uh v shred right i mean obviously that's like something that you've addressed quite a bit but you look at it and oh i did go back and watch that video you recommended that was really well done um uh, i don't remember oh, the guy's name but that um and oh, no, the uh, josh brett guy yes 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 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah i thought you were referring to my video but yeah his videos are mm, they're super yeah. good yeah i was like dude this is like shockingly well produced because when you said it yeah. and i was like like his first like whose first video is that good or like second video whatever usually it's like I, there's a yeah. progression over time and you get a little bit better oh yeah uh, if you look at my first videos they're just like troll dung they're just, yeah. they're just so, i mean they're so bad they're so bad yeah um and i keep them up because like it's it's you know important to show the progression i guess yeah like yeah yeah, I don't think mine um, down, but, but definitely. It, so I was like impressed, but I was like, yeah, it, it's crazy that this guy, I guess just with, with enough marketing power, you reach enough people. But like, I mean, I'm all for freedom of speech and anybody can kind of say what they want, but like, wow. Like the fact that that's out there is just like amazing. Yeah. yeah. And he's not even, honestly, he's not even the worst. I mean, I've, I've seen, I've seen worse than him. Um, and their content, and it kind of like pains me to say this, it's gotten better. Like their ads are still really pushy and just over the top and like cardio doesn't burn calories, it burns carbs or like ridiculous mm. statements like that. Um, but like they have, they have a deadlift tutorial, which is decent. And like some of their content is okay. I, I try to play devil's advocate whenever I, you know, am, am thinking about a source, like the good as well as the bad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of like the marketing it is pretty bad, you know, it's, it's, it's really aggressive and they, they're just targeting people who don't know anything about fitness and who, when they're told like pizza or salad, which right. one would you choose? Like, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh shit. Like I can actually choose the pizza on mm-hmm. this afterburn system or whatever six pack shortcuts bullshit they're, they're yeah, selling yeah, yeah. them. I'm like, how do you compete with that? How do you compete <laughs> with the fucktard selling these people pizza? Right. I mean, it's yeah. just because oh, oh, you can you can utilize the afterburn effect to burn an extra a uh, six pounds of fat per month. And when I'm like, oh. yeah, we're gonna target this rate of weight loss. Like, you have to be consistent. You have to right. like, you know, you might want to track stuff and like you have to check in and shit like that. People are just like, yeah, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the pizza on this one. Right. Yeah. It's no, like, it's tough. I mean. It's, you know, I, I do fine, but it's, it's, it can be frustrating. Yeah. You know, when you see that out there. I want to get back to, we were talking about um, strength levels and just kind of like, I don't know, sometimes it's hard to compare. Like, for instance, I like almost can't compare my strength to like Abel because he does like a lot of like machines and stuff like that. So sometimes, it, I mean, we do, there's some overlap, but um, it seems like you do more free weight exercises. Um, yeah. So what mostly are your, free weight. Yeah. Yeah. So what's some of your so, levels? Um, so right now, so I focus more on like variations of the main lifts most of the mm-hmm. time. Um, and 
you know how like in powerlifting you have a base phase and then a peak phase mm -hmm. it's basically just been a seven year base phase <laughs> yeah like, i've never because like i like hypertrophy training i like reps i'm better at reps mm -hmm. um and i do use low reps at times but it's still usually fairly high volume and it's never like i go into you know a peaking phase or like you know a transition phase and then you know, this goes into this and then like you see the great performance like i don't right, really yeah, yeah. bother powerlifting or, or you know acting or, or training like a powerlifter um so my best squat is 135 kilos not pounds that would be we need pounds <laughs> over here man <laughs> yeah uh, so so in in it's around 300 pounds for um, one yeah for one um which is lower than most people think because when most people see like yeah, definitely 24 25 inch legs that are lean they're assuming too. i'm squatting like four plates or something yeah a good deal more than i am um which is why i just use fake plates right it works super well like they assume <laughs> that i'm fucking strong and i just pretend yeah. to be fucking strong and it's like they just it's like a self-fulfilling thing you know so it's perfect so i just slap another couple of plates and i'm, I'm a five plate squatter nice man yeah yeah two of them are styrofoam per side but like <laughs> Don't tell people that. Um, so 135 kilos. Um, I've also done 120 for 10, okay. which works out to be like uh, 275 pounds for 10, which works out to be a lot better than 300 for one. Yeah, um, yeah a lot better. So I'm just better at reps. Um, I typically squat with a sort of narrower stance, high bar, more upright, just to... to hit the quads basically ass to grass pretty much for the most part um and i'm actually posterior chain dominant i have a 205 kilo uh, 450 ish pound deadlift so mm. my deadlift is a lot it's like 50 percent higher than my squat yeah so if i i know if i wanted to hit like a higher squat i would just go low bar wider stance barely to parallel sort of powerlifting style and I could probably hit at least 350. Because mm -hmm. I've had people who have hit 400 tell me that they couldn't hit 300 if they squatted in the style that I did, sort of like a Platts really? style squat. So, and I might do that, but it tends to bother my labrums, which are both ripped up from running. So mm -hmm. I just generally don't, because if I do low bar, it tends to just because I'm more bent over, it's more hips than knees. And that end range of motion in the hips just like tears me up. You know, I've had times where like I couldn't even sit down wow. for more than like a, a couple of minutes. And that is that is not good for my job, which requires a lot of sitting down and computer usage. So it's like, do I have the choice between hitting a 50 pound PR or being able to like walk and sit down and, and right. other stuff? So like for me, it's no one follows me for my strength anyway. So yeah. it's, you know, I'm very aware of that. So it's yeah, like Lane Norton would say, there's no question there, man. He, yeah. What is it? Sacrifice to win or something. Like yeah. 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 But he, he's actually an example where it's like, I kind of agree with it because he's, he's, he's like really almost a like world record level. Right. Yeah. Like, he's, he set a world record in the squat. Yeah. So yeah. Good. Like if, if you're going to break your body, like Ronnie Coleman, you know, okay. Yeah. He's screwed, but like it was kind of worth it. Right. For right. Him, exactly. Sure. Like, he has enough money, like he can pimp his products to pay for the surgery. So like it kind of right. balances out. You know what I mean? <laughs> and just like Ronnie is one of the few people who stuff. you like can't talk shit about. No. Like Ron, like no one really makes videos about like negative because no, he has no. inspired so many people. And it's like he's one of the few people who gets a pass yeah. on selling like yeah. Tony <laughs> shit. Right, right. I think uh, more plates, more dates did a video on this, and he was like yeah this is shitty but it's also ronnie so yeah ronnie uh, yeah it's hard to say anything negative on ronnie yeah and so like even if he says like he's negative percent body fat or something right it's all <laughs> it right negative. it's all right he's probably <laughs> joking he said it ironically i don't think he did he, say it ironically he definitely didn't but he but he he did sort of yeah right, right. <laughs> um and then bench press i've hit what is that in in pounds i want to say 250 maybe 260 um so yeah nothing amazing there either 
Wow. Um, That's actually, the discrepancy is more than I would have expected. Because like I said, yeah. like in a picture, I mean, you would blow me away, like physique wise. Um, but uh, like just for some of my like main ones, like so best bench was actually more recently. So I've done 225. 300 something. Uh, nice. Well, I did a 365 questionable form. Damn. 35 very good form so i just call it in the middle and say like 350 um nice. but for reps yeah 225 for 16 squat and deadlift i i stopped doing like for health related reasons i stopped like seven years ago so i i will do obviously i still train my legs just as often but i, I don't do like the heavy stuff as much anymore so i kind of always have wondered like how far could i have taken it um but for reference, when I set these numbers, my bench press was like 225 for five to seven. So obviously like just so about the same, much, as, right. the same as me. <laughs> so like just to show how much stronger I've gotten since then. So who knows where I could have taken it, but right. deadlift um, for reps, 405 for 14. Um, I'd have to, I didn't do a lot of one rep maxing actually for my deadlift. Um, I always just- Actually for deadlift, I've hit, I've hit 405 for 10. Okay. So like, again, with reps, like I'm not yeah. like that. So people who have noticed that this is a little glitchy here and there, it's just, we've had some internet connection issues. So if you notice it, like, wait, how did it just jump there real quick? That's why. So we're just putting that together, um, which we'll go back to in a bit. But just to wrap up, so um, I said my bench and deadlift and my best squat um, by far with my long limbs, my worst lift, but not like terrible. Like I was still able to get into like the 400s. Uh, for reps, probably my most impressive was 335 for, I have to go back and look, 12 or 14 reps. Um, nice. So like very reasonable numbers, you know, nothing like on YouTube impressive, but like reasonable for like, but like if you looked at me, you'd be like, nah, I don't think so. So like, it's just size versus well, strength. And, yeah, yeah, totally. So yeah. it's just like, interesting. I'm, I'm bigger than I am strong. Mm -hmm. Like people would expect me to be way stronger than I actually am um and then you're like sort of the opposite and so you know i've had clients who they had like these little these fucking tiny legs and they're squatting two plates and they're like well i want my legs to be bigger but like they just have amazing strength genetics yeah like that's the other way of looking at it. like you could say oh i have shitty size genetics or amazing strength genetics some people have both right but you know a lot of people are skewed one way or the other and there's a lot of overlap you know, across the population, the bigger people are typically stronger. Typically, you just look yeah. at cross-sectional area. But like there are outliers where, you know, you just you see some weird lift. Like you see a skinny guy repping three plates in the bench or like even four plates in the bench. You're just like, what the f he just has like the perfect attachments and you know the central nervous system yeah. fires up the chesticles or like he just leverages or he can get into a really advantageous position. And the deadlift is even weirder because you know. If anything, that's even more yeah, leverage. Definitely. Someone has just freakishly long arms or, you know, maybe like a spinal issue where it effectively shortens their torso. And so their, their arms hang down lower mm -hmm. like Mark Ant or um, the guy who broke his record as well also has, you know, spondylolisthesis or something, mm -hmm. a, a spinal issue. And so they're just ultra leveraged for, for that one lift. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, and like, you know, if they're just walking around in clothes, you'd never expect like a 700 pound deadlifter to look like that. You know, Thor deadlifts 1100 and this guy deadlifts 700, like yeah. he's a third of the size at most. Right, right, like, yeah. You see weird, weird stuff. And it's one of those things where often the grass is greener on the other side. So the people who have great strength genetics and not so great size genetics want to be bigger. And people who have great size genetics, but not so great strength genetics, just want to be stronger. Like I would rather be stronger, but like. But would you though? Like, like to, if you, you had know, to sacrifice like, I, your yeah, size. Exactly. <laughs> like after a week of like me destroying my PRs and looking skinnier, would I be like, yeah, this no, this is not what I want. Like yeah, I'll take the great. muscle. <laughs> yeah, it's like, at the end of the day, especially unless you're a power lifter, your strength is like how much does it really positively impact your life? And I know that's like sacrilege yeah. to a lot of powerlifters who are like, strength right. is everything. Like, 
but especially when if you have to change like one of the reasons that i still do a lot of like the core exercises is it's like all right at least i'm good at that and it it quote unquote matters in the gym because frankly like let's say i switch to all machines well now i don't look impressive and my lips aren't impressive because nobody cares yeah. how much i can like vertical chest press machine press right so no, it's no. like i'm hey, holding bro, on to something that's yeah. impressive i press four plates on the hammer of strength yeah whatever. it's like who cares no one gives a shit and so. i what i i like to at least keep with main variations like for example recently i've been doing like stiff legged deficit deadlifts from like a probably a five or six inch deficit um so it's like one of the most disadvantaged lifts you can mm. actually do it's not like sumo wide stance where you're right you know ultra leverage and you just you know you're using straps and the bar is hanging off your fingertips and yeah, it's like yeah. and you're using a whippy bar right and chalk and everything and there's like the bar and a suit and you're just loading up and yeah you know squatting with knee wraps and huge bench and huge arch in the bench that kind of thing and so for me i when i tell people like i genuinely don't care about maxing out like a power lifter i genuinely don't yeah it's like i would rather do the main lifts but the ones that actually translate to hypertrophy because like you know that super wide stance sumo how much is that really building rather than just like taking away yeah it's a huge stress on the spine like it's not really a huge range of motion that kind of thing or i could you know lighten the weight by quite a bit and you know put myself in a really disadvantaged position make the lift way way harder and you know pull through a greater range of motion and put way more mass on the traps the spinal erectors even the lats just because in the starting position my torso is like less than horizontal so i'm actually yeah. like well, my shoulders are lower than my hips right because it's stiff leg with a deficit you know standing on like almost a couple of red plates so pretty good deficit and i find that like that just is what i prefer to do rather than you know sort of playing the game of powerlifting right and people tend to emphasize things like they put greater importance on things that they're good at which totally makes sense like i have yeah. a friend who like he's very intelligent super short guy great legs not surprisingly, he's like, if I can't see your legs in your picture, I can't even judge your physique at all. Constantly talks about IQ, right? And doesn't seem to acknowledge that like height is actually pretty important and like being 5'5 five five maybe has some disadvantages in life, right? Like, um, but right, like just yeah. to say that like, and not that one thing is good or bad, but just that we focus on that. Like I probably place a little bit more importance on strength because it's something that I was actually good at, but I'm sure right. that if I was bigger, I'd be like, dude, I don't care about strength at all. Like I started to care about strength because I started to excel in it and I wasn't getting the size gains. Right. And I mean, that's a natural right. thing for people to do. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's some, so, sort of a, like a, an innate protective thing. It's like, Oh, I don't care. I don't care about that. Like, I, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and you know, maybe I used to care at some point, and I'm just like, I'd rather do what I'm good at. Um, and of course, there's still like that sort of sense of like, hey, bro, how much do you bench? And I'm like, 250-ish. And they're like, <laughs> I'm just like, uh, like, there's still a little bit of like a sort of like chip on your shoulder, I guess, kind of thing. Yeah. But then like, I guess a greater part of me is just like, well, I seem to be doing all right with my 200. Right. Um, bench, like, right, right. Doesn't really, if like, when you step back, I don't know, like, it doesn't seem to actually, you know, provide a lot of, of value to my life. Sure. But again, yeah, if I was better at it, like, yeah, maybe it would. Yeah. So uh, before we run into another freezing internet, let's we'll close <laughs> out here and then maybe we'll, we'll don't jump back to the uh, one other topic. So um, I think, you know, we'll have links to everything down below, but where can people find more of your stuff? Um, it's pretty much my my name on everything, I think. Um, yeah, just Jeffrey Verity Schofield, far too long of a name. Um, one, of the thing about, one of the things about being on the internet is you get advice from everyone, even mm -hmm. when you don't ask. I've had so many people like say that I should shorten my name. Yeah. Just like chop out the Verity or, or chop out the first name or the last name. But yeah, it's, it's basically just my name, Jeffrey Verity Schofield, or uh, Instagram, YouTube, and Quora. 
Also known. So is Verity your middle name or is it like Jeffrey Verity is your first name? Uh, middle name, yeah. Okay, so you yeah. just choose to have it in there. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, so we'll wrap up on this topic and we can leave it in there. So we're talking about John Cena. He messed up, right? You live in China. I don't know anything about this other than that he said Taiwan was a country, which I was under the impression it was. Uh, and I guess that's a big no. So what happened there? Well, the thing is, so this is probably the touchiest topic in all of China. Like if you want, if there was like a plan about how to piss off like <laughs> 1.4 billion people, this would be it. Like wow. this would literally be it. An American superstar saying in Chinese, <laughs> or at least implying, I, don't, I forgot exactly what he said, but like it was bad. Mm. Um, and this is something Americans don't understand and Westerners don't understand. It's really hard to explain. It's not the same as like if Hawaii left the U.S. a while ago and now it's its own country and we're 49 states and Hawaii is doing its own thing. It's different than that because like it's a lot more cultural and it's a lot more nationalistic and you know Chinese people can be extremely nationalistic um, which you know it's sort of a sensitive topic even for me to talk about but you know just him saying you know that Taiwan is its own country particularly him saying it in Mandarin Chinese I think he said it in is uh is pretty bad like and and it's one of the only things for example i used to teach english here mm -hmm. and in one of my classes i remember it was year four or five that i was teaching and one of the students tried to trap me she stood up in the back of the class and yelled taiwan island is a part of china and like she was trying to bait me into arguing with her because you know a lot of foreigners do think that it's his own country. I mean, it's it's autonomous. It's it runs itself. It's not beholden really to the mainland. And so, so like China is saying that autonomous. it's just part of China. Yeah. And Taiwan itself would say it's its own country. Well, sort of, because they haven't officially declared their independence. And if they did, China would most likely attack. And try to like but like it's it's still chinese people there so it's like they can't like nuke them or anything like that it's a really weird situation and then america might get involved but probably not because taiwan's really close to china and really far away from the u.s right There's like military bases all over and it's kind of a shit show and so it's almost wow. like the status quo of where taiwan can't declare their own independence and um but like effectively everyone sort of knows that they are independent they just can't say it because if they did shit would go down wow and and then people here are really nationalistic about it um and then hong kong is also an issue and yeah yeah it's kind of a kind <laughs> of a mess um but yeah basically uh he messed up really bad because it's it's one thing to learn mandarin but like you also have to know about these social sociocultural issues and that's a big one that's a, a big big one um and that's another thing that i think a lot of americans don't understand they think like the average chinese person is just like brainwashed by the government or like wouldn't be supportive of the government or like wants democracy really badly or anything like that but the average chinese person is like wholly in favor and in support of the chinese government mm -hmm. like 90 they probably have like a 90 or 95 percent support rate approval rating wow um, which is and that's genuine that's not like all right guys as you can see jeffrey here has been frozen by the chinese government and so that is where we are going to end the podcast